Cano has a PhD in economics from Universidad de Campinas. He was the vice president of both the IDB and the World Bank. He was also executive director for Brazil at both the World Bank and the IMF. He has been a serial fellow at Brookings Institution and uh, he has written extensively on topics related to economic development. Uh, as we have announced, Otaviano will speak today about economic development in Colombia, Brazil, and South Korea. And no more introductions, uh, Otaviano, please take the floor and go ahead. Sorry. Hola. You, Otaviano, I, we cannot hear you. You are muted. Okay. Okay. Yes, no, no, I'm, I'm on. Okay, great. So I was saying that it's a pleasure to be, uh, when Luis Alvarez uh, made me the invitation, I, 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 I accepted immediately. It's been some time. Uh, oh, and by the way, I was executive director for a constituency of countries that includes Colombia. Yes. So I represented Colombia at the World Bank in the two times that I was uh, uh, at the board there. And, uh, and I love Colombia. Uh, and uh, I've been there uh, many times over these 15 years. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to chance. I really, uh, it's easy for a Brazilian to, to love Colombia, but, uh, but in any case, so uh, what I thought of bringing for us today is the following. I, I wrote many pieces about the middle income trap. Uh, even though the, the, the idea, the concept, the, the, uh, the, the terminology uh, appeared uh, as early as 2007 when the, the World Bank prepared the report, Intermit Gill and Homi Karas, the two former colleagues, wrote a report to Malaysia and they used the expression for the first time. But it hit so well, the court, that you know, if one Googles middle income trap, uh, the references in, in, in 14 years, the, the, they are numerous. And including myself, who developed a couple of models uh, with Pierre Richard Agenot, now at the University of Manchester, uh, on, on multiple equilibria uh, uh, in a growth trajectory of a country, one of which is the middle income trap. Uh, and just to give an idea, when I was a VP at the World Bank back in 2012 or 2013, I was interviewed by Radio China International and uh, not in Mandarin, I don't speak Mandarin. Uh, and, and the guys on the middle income trap. And, and two weeks later, the guys called me to tell me that my interview had broken their records of them, not because of my name, not because of Taviano Canuto, but because any well-informed uh, Chinese, when he or she hears the expression middle income trap, they open the eyes and they, they get interested. They fear uh, going through the same fate as Brazil has gone. And, uh, and, and, and so the, the subject attracted uh, so much attention until nowadays. Now, okay. What, what is the middle income trap? It is the case of many developing countries that succeeded in evolving from low per capita income levels to, to uh, middle income levels, but then appeared to stall, losing momentum along the route toward the higher income levels of advanced economies. And that trap may well characterize the experience of Brazil and most of Latin America, including Colombia, one might say. Uh, I will check with you guys whether it makes sense to say so since the 80s. No? And, and the reason why I added uh, South Korea to this conversation, it's because Korea since the 80s maintained its pace of evolution, reaching a high income status nowadays. One of the, my first chart uh, would show to you the trajectory of GDP per capita since 1990. And I compared Korea, Brazil, and Colombia. And interestingly, uh, Colombia has not only caught up with Brazil, but seems to be on the verge of even overcoming Brazil. 
but still both very far from the trajectory of South Korea. And uh, things of life, 30 years ago, my PhD thesis was on Brazil and South Korea. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, some, uh, some of the things that I, that I approached there in my PhD thesis 30 years ago only became stronger as time passed by. And, and uh, in my argument, the, the argument of my presentation here is that such a divergence of economic growth can be related to the distinctive performance uh, of domestic accumulation of technological and organization, organization capabilities. My argument is that what we see as total factor productivity, what we see as the extra mile in terms of growth of the countries can be related to the accumulation, the domestic accumulation of capabilities. Uh, 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 that what lies behind the divergence of performance of TFP that is behind the discrepancy. And I also argue, I do this in a book, a, re a recently released book, but also in, in several writings, that uh, this, di those differences in, in the accumulation of capabilities are related to the trade approach. This is clearly the case between Brazil and South Korea. Uh, while South Korea uh, uh, used well the, uh, the opportunities opened by the, the global value chain revolution in international trade, Brazil remained closed and is still closed. Colombia has a different approach, I know, but it's still, when we compare the whole Latin America, even including Chile, Latin America remains closed in terms of trade. And my argument is that the uh, uh, Korea managed to combine the opportunities opened by the, the global value change revolution in trade. I don't have to tell you, this is a well-known uh, subject uh, by now, but also they, they combine the trade opening, the insertion into value chains with the domestic accumulation of capabilities, of technological capabilities. Uh, investing, of course, uh, okay, it will say a bit this, but, uh, but let me say the following. And, and I have two charts in the presentation that you will see comparing uh, the data of countries, including from the region and also from, from other parts of the, of the emerging market world, uh, two concepts of middle income trap. One of them is in absolute terms. Uh, as, as you know, the, the World Bank has uh, this classification of countries according to low income countries, middle income countries split into two groups, lower middle income countries and high middle income countries and, high, and, and then the high income countries. And interestingly, uh, by the absolute approach, when one looks at when most of Latin America, uh, including Brazil and Colombia, enter into the middle income range, and this is where they still are today. So they never left. Okay, more recently, depending on the criteria uh, that one used to define the thresholds of income per capita, uh, Chile, Uruguay, managed to go up. Uh, but it's very, very, not very far from, from, from uh, where the other ones are. I, I gave you figures in the slides to, to illustrate this. And the other concept of middle income trap is a relative one, is the convergence or lack of convergence to the frontier, typically uh, the GDP per capita of the US. And I have a, a, a chart uh, showing how the, uh, as a percentage of the United States, while emerging and developing Asia have moved in the last 30 years from 5% in 1990 to something close to 20% nowadays, uh, 2020 to be, to be in, uh, in fact. I, I took the data from the, the World Economic Outlook database. And also uh, in, in, in Europe, the emerging and developing Europe has also moved since 2000 from something close to 25% of the US GDP to nowadays 40, 42%.
Latin America and the, the Caribbean. On the contrary, uh, in the in the first half, in the first decade of the new millennium, uh, managed to move from 25% to 30%, but we've been declining as a, as a percentage vis-a-vis -vis the GDP per capita of the US. So uh, I, I like to characterize the middle income as a stage of growth and development. Uh, and that's this, the specificity is exactly the difference of necessary policies and necessary process vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the early stage of the change from low income to, to middle income. We all grew up, uh, you know, studying in, 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 this, in school. I studied uh, the, the, the whole uh, literature on the poverty traps and so on, the several hypotheses and so on. And we also uh, learned and, 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 and hear about the challenge faced by, by high income countries to overcome what Larry Summers and others have pointed out as secular stagnation. So the point about the middle income trap is that the, the issues and challenges and necessary policies are different both from, uh, let's say, uh, the advanced economies, but also different from uh, those faced by low income countries. Uh, see, uh, there is a, a, a common process, a single process that can be used to approach 100% of the experience, at least to my knowledge, of upgrade from low to middle income. I always in my uh, classes or, or talks and so on, I always challenge someone to tell me one country that moved from low to middle income country that did not follow uh, uh, a process that I'm gonna describe very, very uh, in a summarized way now. Resembling a lot old Lord uh, Arthur Lewis, the, the, the old model uh, that gave him the Nobel prize and which still applies. So in all the case of uh, evolution from low to middle income, uh, the similar underlying development process is one in which there is a large pool of unskilled labor that is transferred from subsistence level occupations to more modern manufacturing or service activities that do not require much skill upgrade from those workers, but nonetheless employ higher levels of capital and of embedded technology. And uh, typically the, the technology is available from richer countries and it's easy to adapt to local circumstance. And the point is that the simple effect, the growth effect of such a transfer, usually happening in tandem with urbanization is the substantial increase in total factor productivity. That is to say an expansion of the value of GDP that goes beyond what can be explained by the expansion of labor, capital, and other physical factors of production to the economy. It is clearly uh, remembering Moses Abramovitz, uh, uh, the, where is our ignorance about what happens in this transition? It is exactly a total factor productivity increase that is made, made possible by simply transferring people from occupation without much requirements. And this is what lies behind uh, the, the, the jumps in Japan after World War II, is what lies behind South Korea, Hong Kong, China, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, in the first phase of, of the, the growth and development of these countries. Uh, it, it was behind Brazil and Mexico in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It was what lies behind uh, China, the, the 30 glorious years of China uh, uh, growing at two digits were to a large extent exactly the replication of this process. And, uh, but there is an issue. Uh, the, the, those low hanging fruits in terms of growth opportunities, they sooner or later face limits after which growth may slow down and the economy may get trapped in middle income levels. The turning point in this transition occurs 
either when the pool of transferable unskilled labor is exhausted, as it was to a large extent what happened in cases like Korea and the other and the Asian tires, or in some cases when the expansion of labor absorbing modern activities peaks before that exhaustion happens. As I think it was the case in the region, definitely, uh, because of macroeconomic dysfunctions and the limits of the import substitution industrialization strategy that we adopted. So beyond this point, raising total factor productivity and maintaining a fast growth pace becomes dependent on the economy's domestic ability to move upward in manufacturing service or agriculture value chains towards activities now characterized by technological sophistication. And this goes in tandem uh, with the attainment of the higher requirements in terms of human capital and intangible assets, such as then I come with my capabilities, design and organizational capabilities. Uh, so the, the path from low to middle and then to high income per capita uh, corresponds to increasing the shares of the population moved from subsistence activities to simple modern tasks and then to sophisticated ones. Uh, with uh, with uh, now, within sector productivity gains and moving up value chains, rising in weight relative to productivity lifting simple cross sector structural change. So we start to have uh, within sector productivity gains as more important for growth than simply uh, people moving among sectors from structural change. Now, uh, the issue is that an institutional setting supportive of innovations and of complex chains of market transactions is of the essence. So instead of mastering existing standardized technologies, the, the challenge becomes the local creation of domestic capabilities and institutions which cannot be simply brought or copied from abroad. Uh, provision of education to labor and, and also provision of appropriate infrastructure becomes also a minimum condition. Uh, Brazil saw the transfer of labor from subsistence lab employment slow well before they had exhausted. And it was easy. That's how uh, Lula comes from the Northeast and becomes uh, a, a factory worker in Sao Paulo. But the case in Brazil, the macroeconomic mismanagement uh, over the last four decades, as well as, you know, with ups and downs, obviously, but in the inward looking orientation, established early limits to that labor transfer process. Uh, but then we, you have some enclaves. And that's why you have uh, Brazil, as, as you know, there are some enclaves that have been well established in high positions on global value chains. I, I'm referring to the, the part of the Brazilian uh, agriculture, which is technology intensive. I'm thinking of the sophisticated deep sea oil drilling capabilities uh, developed by Petrobras before it was submitted to the, to the policies of the, uh, of the PT government. Uh, in, in, in the second mandate of Lula and Dilma, and also the aircraft industry, uh, the Embraer. So you have these enclaves, but uh, co-living with uh, uh, a sea as well of people still performing activities, productivity of which is close to subsistence. That's why uh, it's a middle income, high middle income. Brazil is classified as a high middle income country, uh, but with a substantial number of people still in poverty and the average not low. Okay, what one chart uh, that I chose to you, taken from a, a work that I did on, on natural, natural wealth to show is the following. There is a, a common composition, uh, there is a, a common path uh, as any country ascends the, the, uh, the, the, the ladder of income. Uh, uh, in one in which three aspects are worth highlighting. First, uh, human capital 
the stock of human capital has a high weight in all states and it increases. So in relative terms, in the composition of wealth uh, of a country, uh, the, 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 the weight of human capital ascends if the economy is to move up the ladder. I, I used in, the, in, the, in my works and in the charts, uh, uh, the latest results of a, a wealth measurement exercise that the World Bank has, has been doing well, occasionally, you know, each five years or so. I was myself involved with one of them when I was a vice president. And it's a, a really a contribution to, to national accounting because the World Bank makes this, this effort very hard to do of measuring the natural wealth of all countries. I have the figures, I have a table, a chart that you will see comparing uh, the size of natural wealth of Colombia, Brazil, uh, Korea, and, and, and Chile. And obviously there is a huge difference between Korea, which is resource poor, and the, and, and, and the other three countries. But what matters is that, you know, of course, in, in, in such an exercise of, of wealth measurement, the, there is a huge difference among the countries, but they all have the same thing in common. In all countries, human capital have a high and increasing weight. And obviously those countries that managed to overcome the middle income trap, they had such accumulation of human capital. Also, uh, the, 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 uh, the weight of natural resource richness decreases in, in relative terms along the asset. The heterogeneity uh, of countries in terms of richness remains there because obviously when, one, when we look at the, account, the accounts of Norway, a high income country and Canada is still the natural resource wealth plays a relative term. You know, uh, in, my read, in my writings as well, and in the book that, I, that, I, that I'm referring to, uh, I use the, the research and I did some empirical research on this associating natural resource wealth either to blessing or curse, depending on, on governance and the corresponding macroeconomic, uh, 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 macroeconomic uh, uh, management. Uh, I like to refer to Botswana and Zimbabwe as two countries who share the same underlying wealth in terms of diamonds, the same mine, the same source. And, uh, and while Zimbabwe has become the nightmare that it is, you know, uh, with the hyperinflation uh, and, and destruction and poverty, Botswana has fared so well that nowadays Botswana has even a rating for its public debt that is better than the Japanese. And, and despite the problems that they have with, uh, with uh, uh, HIV AIDS, etc., Botswana has social indicators that are better than ours. And they, they have the same wealth base. And then the difference lies on, 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 on governance, on the quality of governance, and, and on the way by which in Botswana, for instance, the natural wealth, was, uh, uh, as time passed by, being transformed into other assets. Uh, that is to say human capital uh, and produced capital. And then I go to my third component that you guys might be, well, this guy has talked about natural wealth, has spoken about uh, human capital, but what about the produced capital, fixed capital? Yes, of course, fixed capital is important, but interestingly, and you will see in the chart that I'm going to say, show, uh, send to you, is that the proportion of fixed capital in the wealth remains reasonably constant. So it is not accumulation of produced capital, that is to say, fixed capital, machines, equipments, uh, basic infrastructure, buildings. That's not what makes the wealth, that's not what makes the accumulation, that's not what makes the, the upheaval. It, it rises proportionately to the income per capita, but, it, but it's not the explanation. Uh, my generation, I, I was trained 
thinking uh, always in terms of Cap Douglas, thinking or or CES on uh, constant elasticity of substitution, always uh, thinking in terms of accumulating fixed capital, investing in ma machines, equipments, and buildings, and, and basic infrastructure. Uh, whereas what the, the data show clearly, well, there was a reason for that. When I grew up, uh, when I was studying uh, at the University of Campinas, the paradigm through which uh, everyone uh, saw technical progress was much more, it, it was in synchrony with the second industrial revolution, with Fordism, with, with, uh, with the machines and, and equipments bringing the technological progress embedded in them. Uh, so it was not so much detached from, from, from reality. But the question is that ultimately it cannot explain the difference uh, of uh, the results of incorporating a machine uh, depends on, on, on the, the capabilities that the users have in using it. And, and that depends on human capital and other things. I, one of my slides makes a reference to a recent working paper by, uh, uh, from the IMF, uh, where the author uh, shows, uh, let me give you the results of, of uh, the guy uh, makes a comparison between uh, Latin America and uh, in, in developing countries in East Asia and, and in Europe. And he points that the, the I'm getting there. He points that uh, the lack of conversions in Latin America is not the result of low investment ratios. The, he points out how, how low investment is the result of low total factor productivity and therefore of GDP growth. So it's not the cause. It doesn't suffice simply to imagine, okay, let's devise the, the acquisition of equipment and so on, because first of all, if TFP, if total factor productivity does not evolve appropriately, uh, buying those machines, making the investment is not attractive. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the IMF working paper by, by uh, Bakar, uh, Gonzantia, uh, Alex Ho, and Vida Nandan, I will send you the, the reference. Uh, shows that the cross-country difference of total factor productivity are in fact associated with difference in human capital, governance, and business climate indicators. So uh, the, the weight of produced capital stabilized in relative terms after the ascent from low income levels, and, uh, and it is not what explains. Uh, in fact, in a nutshell, uh, in my in, in, in my book and in my papers, I list uh, uh, a morphing set of policy priorities if an economy is to move beyond the track from low to middle income states. Uh, so it's, in fact, uh, in some cases of middle income trap, you see this fixation in trying to replicate old policies when they no longer uh, give you the, 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 uh, the results that they did in the past. A typical case of this was President Dilma's policies in the 2010s in Brazil in the first half, when she tried to use exactly the type of policies and instruments that had been used in the 50s and 60s in Brazil. The same thing, uh, channeling subsidized finance to increase investments in, the, in corporates, which did not do it. They used the, the money uh, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, diminish their debts, but did not increase investment. It's by uh, increasing the local content, as, as Dilma did in the case of Petrobras and, and in other sectors. Uh, is uh, So those old policies that may have functioned, even if not perfectly well. In the past, they seem to be the ones appropriate for this new stage from middle to high income. A second trait, second aspect is the fact that innovation matters more as the economy approaches the technological frontier. 
and uh, and and so uh, the opportunity driven entrepreneurship, which is often built on new ideas or technology, increasingly outweighs the necessity driven entrepreneurship, which responds to to existing market needs. Uh, incentives are fundamental, of course, because the technological capabilities that I'm referring to since the beginning, they are investments. They, they do not fall from heaven. They do not appear out of the blue or simply uh, with uh, education or other attributes. You have to have economic agents investing, that is to say, incurring in costs to build assets uh, the return to which they see as, as, as interesting. And that includes not only the training, but also the development of technological capabilities. And when I say technological capabilities, there is another chart as well that I, that I intended to use, which is a sequence of capabilities that starts from production capabilities to adaptation capabilities up to innovation capabilities. And guess what? All Asian successful case follow that sequence. It applies to China, to South Korea, to Singapore, to Japan, uh, which is this move, learning from the, 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 the existing technologies and using well, and then developing the, the, the ability to adapt those technologies. And, and this goes in tandem exactly with uh, the local capabilities, which is something idiosyncratic, tacit, cannot be imported from abroad, and depends on the investments that the 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 uh, the, the economic agents uh, take on on creating such a capabilities until reaching uh, reaching the the invasion capabilities. Let me tell you something. My PhD thesis thirty years ago, I distinguished. Uh, the the structure of incentives typically used in, in uh, typically accompanying industrial policies in Korea to the ones in Brazil, and and the ones in in, in South Korea were what I called at the time helping winners and screwing the the losers, because there was a pattern in the in the Korean industrial policies. Uh, there was the protection, of course, uh, but which was did not stay uh, eternally, but they had the subsidies through the, 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 the public banks, but there was a pattern. The, the, only the successful, only the ones who showed the better results in terms of either occupying a market share abroad in or producing at decreasing costs and price domestically. If you succeed in that regard, then you had more subsidies. Then you were authorized to diversify your production line. If not, you got screwed in the middle, in the middle of the, the story. And what we know nowadays as the shables, I said that three years ago, they were, they are the, the outcome of a, an evolutionary process, a Schumpeterian process in which the last efficient died. Dai Wu was the, the, the last big conglomerate to die during the, the Asian financial crisis. But in fact, all the others, Hyundai, uh, 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 all, all the conglomerates, they were the ones that invested. And, and, and compare this with Brazil. Brazil, the logic it was helping winners and helping losers. Uh, and, and, and so the logic, the microeconomic logic in such a circumstance for you to do is the following. Uh, you get your profits and you diversify your wealth, regardless of the uh, existence or not of synergies among the, among the, the items of your wealth. Uh, because what you want to do is to maximize the frontiers through which you interact with the state, with the public sector, in order to get more subsidies. Uh, whereas in Korea, uh, the profits were used by, by the companies to, to bring the, over weekends uh, engineers from Japan to tell them the, the secrets of, uh, of the, the manufacturing process in Japan. 
So I, I, I repute that this uh, microeconomic structure of incentives, which is associated with governance, uh, of course, uh, is what lies behind the, uh, the drive by South Koreans to accumulate technological capabilities as, com capabilities as compared to, to Brazil. Uh, I, uh, and then I, 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 one of my slides is one that I built uh, using the data from the, the bank on, on wealth to compare the structures of wealth of Brazil, South Korea, Colombia, and I also add the Chile because uh, Chile is a comparable case, given that, you know, in terms of size and, and, and so on. And in, in our region, only apart from Puerto Rico and Aruba, which are not really the national economies, uh, you only have Bahamas, Panama, and Trinidad Tobago, Tobago above Chile. So Chile is uh, in comparable countries, uh, a successful case. And, and what the chart, what it shows, is the humongous difference in what? I already spoke about natural capital. Just to give an idea, Brazil has had in 2014, in per capita terms, something close to $36,000 per capita. Colombia had 15, uh, almost 16,000 per capita. Chile had then 55,000. In Korea, South Korea has had 4,000. Now, when you go to produced capital, also differences are high because South Korea uh, made a huge investment. So South Korea had in 2014, $126,000 in terms of a per capita produced capital, whereas Brazil had 32,000, Colombia 27,000 and Chile 45,000. But where the difference appears, uh, in a, a very in a very short way is in human capital, uh, which reflects education and and the intangible assets that I was referring to. Brazil, one hundred twenty three thousand dollars in terms of human uh, human capital per capita. Colombia, eighty seven thousand dollars in terms of human uh, capital per capita. Chile, one hundred forty thousand. Uh, per capita wealth in terms of human capital and South Korea, $290,000. And that's where uh, the argument that I make is that this, th th those different stocks of wealth per capita, uh, including their different composition, are, is what explains uh, why uh, those countries had such a discrepant uh, per capita income with a better, with a, uh, uh, a slight advantage for Chile back in 2014, and uh, I, 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 I will shorten my no, no worries. Uh, the, the, uh, how about the role played by trade you know, by globalization? Uh, well, first thing is not the sectors that explain. Of course, manufacturing has some distinctive features vis-a-vis -vis the other ones. Convergence to the frontier, uh, or at least increases in productivity, are easier to obtain in manufacturing. Uh, in most cases, you, the simply transplant of machines and, and layouts and equipments uh, with the minimum conditions for installation uh, allows for uh, uh, an uptick in productivity. But the same ease of, uh, of uh, obtaining uh, gains in productivity uh, approaching the frontier uh, gives a vulnerability because once location circumstance, once uh, locational advantages change, also the same uh, manufacturing industry can move. And, and we in the region suffered a lot of this because with the emergence of Asia, uh, we, uh, Latin America kind of got crushed in, uh, in terms of manufacturing. But the point that I want to make is that advances in, even in the same manufacturing require the capabilities. And the, it is the capabilities that explain the sectors uh, rather than the contrary. Okay, 
and this is a, a very important argument because you may, some of you may be structuralists, uh, of course. Uh, but I, I keep facing in my debates very much a structuralist point of view is still very much alive uh, among many in Brazil. And also uh, we see Danny Roderick uh, saying this, kind of attributing uh, the success to the sectors, which sometimes, which may, may lead to inappropriate policy such as this. Okay, so let's put protection, let's install manufacturing industry, and then the technological progress and TFP comes, which is not uh, uh, correct. You need the capabilities to think of the uh, upgrade within the value chains, as as uh, they all Asians know, and and uh, and, and China does, and and that that's a, a quite important difference as well. Look, I think of Brazil, and I I, I also. Uh, I'm sure it's the case of, of, of Colombia. Uh, while we were moving along the low to middle income levels, the education of the, of the, the population of labor force was never a priority uh, as, as much as it was and it has been in Asia. So even before the exhaustion of the gains from the, 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 the low hanging fruits of the first transition, uh, uh, the Asians uh, invested in, in education. The, the latest doing so well in this regard is Vietnam. And also in all of them, including Korea, uh, my, my thesis of 30 years ago already pointed out how the, the framework of industrial policy in Korea changed in the 80s when they, they, they uh, passed by the phase of heavy industrialization and, and the, 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 uh, the new frontier became the automobile and the, the electronics and so on, the guys changed their, their, their institutional environment. The, 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 the business environment changed. And uh, because it has to be the business environment in the country, besides education, as I said, besides the supply of people with the minimum skills to 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 uh, accumulate human capital while they they work they are employed but also you know you have to make the system more friendly to an economy where the transactions are more frequent where you have so you have to have a business environment uh, that functions that not impose costs you, you have to have uh, you know, the business to hire, to fire, you have to have a uh, settlement of uh, contractual litigations that does not impose costs. You have to have a judicial system that works uh, in, a, in a friendly way uh, to business. You have to have uh, 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 trading, trading across the board, regardless of tariffs, beyond tariffs or non-tariff barriers. It has to be easy to trade. Well, abroad. Uh, I, I'm talking about all the chapters of the doing business environment, the doing business report of the World Bank, which by the way, I attribute the, the, the recent better performance of Colombia vis-a-vis -vis Brazil, allowing for the catch up exactly among other reasons uh, to the better macroeconomic management of Colombia uh, and to the improvements in the business environment. That what makes a difference and why is that? Because a bad operating in a bad business environment, business environment, I mean, uh, what happens uh, outside the, 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 the plant, the firm and the economy, uh, opening a firm, closing a firm, uh, solving a bankruptcy, uh, uh, solving litigations, uh, uh, acquiring, uh, uh, accessing energy, uh, trading abroad in, in all those chapters of the life of, of an enterprise. Because when you have a, a bad business environment, that sucks human material and, and human and, 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 and materials as well. So that drags pr productivity. That is uh, what you know, sucks. Uh, so having a business, a good business environment is part of the recipe for uh, uh, leaving the middle income uh, uh, middle income uh, levels to higher in 
income levels. And guess what? You know, these countries that I'm referring to as successful ones, they all uh, have business environments in, in, in that fashion, including China. Uh, China now, the, the government uh, the, the has got the grip on the high tech to be seen uh, to what extent that will uh, have an impact on the, the ability of China to keep moving in the high tech sectors. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that in the remainder of the of the China's economy, uh, you have a, a, a very uh, easy to operate business environment. And that's, uh, compare this with uh, most of our region. Colombia has made improvements. Now, and there are two charts as well that will show you the emergence of China and, and, and Korea as innovators. Uh, the charts show the, the, the superb evolution in recent times of R&D, of research and development expenditures, gross domestic expenditures on, on R&D in both China and Korea. And also show another chart shows the outcome of, of, of this, which is the patents. And it's incredible how both now are rising up in patents, uh, particularly uh, in, in including Korea. And, and so this is, uh, uh, they use the, the, the knowledge uh, transferred through globalization to develop their own capabilities of innovating. And that's what lies, uh, lies behind the, the, the uh, well, I don't have to tell you, uh, Brazil remained delinked from the new global value chains. Uh, you talk to some Brazilians and they will say, uh, proud, the structuralists particularly. Wow, well, look at how dense are the Brazilian production chains. Mercosur produce almost 100% of, of, of its automobiles. Uh, look at how integrated we are. And then I say, wow, and the, and the levels of, of integration, domestic integration in Brazil, they are superior to any comparable uh, other emerging market. And I said, but that's the recipe for disaster because the Brazilian automobiles are less efficient and more expensive than, than the, the competitors. It only sells to Argentina besides Brazil. So the closeness of the Brazilian economy, and I have several works comparing the levels of tariffs, the levels of non-tariff trade barriers and controlling econometrically by the size and by the geographical position, Brazil is the most closed uh, uh, middle income country compared to all the others. That impedes exactly the absorption, the utilization of already existing good technologies and so on. Uh, it, it's a pity uh, that uh, the current government that started with uh, uh, a promise of uh, opening trade but it, it, it has not done anything in that regard. Bolsonaro only opened the trade of arms, the import of, of, of armaments. Uh, and in everything that is happening uh, with the management of the Amazon uh, is jeopardizing, uh, has put into risk even the, the agreement between Mercosur and the European Union. So Brazil remains closed and that takes a toll. Uh, one chart that I would uh, present to you that we will be able to see later is about the premature deindustrialization experienced in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I, I, I show you, uh, I, I, I used a recent report by the World Bank to compare the, the productivity uh, by sector in the region relative to that of the United States. And then I have there Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, Peru. And let me tell you what the comparison shows is the following. Uh, remember the, the, the expression by, by, uh, during the campaign of Clinton, it's productivity stupid. The, the difference in productivity go across all sectors. And therefore, uh, if it's productivity, uh, the problem lies in the underlying accumulation of capabilities. Uh, in pervasive productivity issues are affecting all sectors of the, the, 
the region's economy. The chart shows clearly. Uh, uh, and I also have a chart uh, there that we'll see an exercise that I did with a, a, a friend and colleague from Brazil uh, making the following simulation. Look, let's assume that Brazil had the same occupational structure as the US, the same occupational structure using the labor occupation as a, a benchmark of the structure uh, of the sectors. Then the Brazilian aggregate productivity would move up 68%. Wow, did you say, wow, see? If Brazil had uh, the sectors that the US has, uh, the, the productivity would be 68% higher. Yes, all right. But, but the other exercise is the following. If Brazil and US had the same occupation, uh, the same uh, structure that they have today, and if they had the same productivity levels at each sector, you know what? Then the Brazilian aggregate productivity would be 576.9% higher. Yeah. Well, the problem is less of the occupation of the structure and more the one of the productivity, which reflects, as I said, the accumulation or lack of accumulation of the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, domestic uh, capabilities, including technological capabilities. So, and I will stop here. Uh, what makes the difference is, uh, uh, the absence or the presence of those attributes, those factors that increase the, the total factor productivity, which depends on the accumulation of human capital, that is to say education in uh, inappropriate business environment. Uh, obviously infrastructure matters, particularly if you go to high, in order to go to high income uh, levels, you have to have the infrastructure, the kind of advanced infrastructure that is necessary uh, to, to operate in sophisticated segments of the value chains. In our days, this includes appropriate telecommunications and so on. But there is this and also macroeconomic stability because if, if you don't have macroeconomic stability, when, uh, the, the risk premium that investors establish uh, is high, and this curves, tends to curb the investment in the information of, of uh, capabilities accumulation. Well, I spoke too much, but I, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you, okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, now I want to open the discussion to, to questions and comments. Uh, uh, whoever wants to speak, please raise your hands or uh, who wants to start? Uh, Armando, hay personas que entraron después de que empezó Taviano y no saben porque me están preguntando por las gráficas. Entonces, si usted puede contar a todos eh, lo que sucedió como breve para que se entienda después Otaviano nos va a enviar la presentación. Okay, what happened is that Otaviano had a technological problem and he could not, uh, he was not able to say, to, you know, to project the uh, his slides, and he will send them uh, to us later, okay? Luis Alvaro is asking, uh, you know, uh, wants to um, ask a question. Luis Alvaro, go ahead, please. Okay, Otaviano, oh, thanks a lot for your presentation. No, my question uh, is looking forward, uh, where we, we are where we are now, and all of the Latin American countries face similar uh, problems and we seem to be falling behind. Uh, if the core of moving forward is capabilities, I have a couple of questions. Are they public, private, who leads? And uh, what are the policy options that you see uh, to kind of uh, switch paths? Right. So, yeah. Great. Uh, look, Luis. Uh, Basically, uh, if you don't have uh, the accumulation of technological capabilities by the private sector, you don't get there. And we all know how, how 
uh, one cannot rely on a state-led economic structure to display the increase of productivity and in such a, a, a capability. So we, we, we have the experience of the command-driven uh, economies. And the success of China uh, in doing so well up to here was exactly when Deng Xiaoping uh, opened the special economic zones and allowed a, a very wild form of capitalism to operate there, maybe too wild for our taste because uh, uh, China, the, 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 the China is a wild capitalist uh, uh, function. Uh, I, I can uh, send you the figures showing how social protection is very low. They don't have basic health service. Uh, they don't have pensions. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's one of the reasons for the high savings rate of China, uh, because either you save for your retirement or you were doomed. Either you save for uh, health problems that you might have or, or, or schooling of your kids, uh, you are doomed. Uh, so uh, China has a very wild capitalism. So uh, even if uh, the, 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 the banking system, it is still state. Uh, I, 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 I heard, I, I personally heard uh, when, when, I, when I was uh, VP at the World Bank in December, 2011, uh, Bob Zalik, my boss, uh, sent me to China, to the Hall of People in Beijing to represent the World Bank in a ceremony celebrating 10 years of uh, China in the WTO. Uh, and there I was together with uh, uh, Pascal Lamy, the WTO, and also Sopashai, uh, Unktad, and in President Hu Jintao. And President Hu Jintao said it. Now we, the, the expression China's rebalancing has become common, but I heard it from him, from the mouth, from the horse's mouth uh, in, in Beijing, uh, talking about rebalancing China from out of uh, investments and exports towards domestic consumption, uh, uh, out of uh, manufacturing in relative terms towards service, and, and moving up the, 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 the value chains. I heard that from him speaking. I said that on behalf of the World Bank, and then uh, the script was all uh, set before, of course, and then he confirmed, uh, he responded uh, positively to message, the message that I sent. And Hu Jintao also included the rebalancing between the private and the public sector. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping has put a break on this. Uh, but the, the original plan was, you know, in those sectors like steel or, or banking or financial uh, activities where the, the, the private sector already performs and better than, than, than the public sector uh, entities. The, 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 the last article four done by China, uh, done, done on China by the IMF brings some figures comparing the productivities, the productivity of the SOEs, the state owned enterprise with the private owned enterprise and, and, and the difference is large. Okay, uh, Xi Jinping decided to stop this, but the fact of the matter is that it illustrates quite well the response that I have to give to you. It's the private sector. Uh, of course, uh, having a public sector that functions minimal in a, uh, in a de efficient way matters because uh, uh, a badly functioning uh, state public sector takes a toll on the, on the productivity of the private sector. So yes. Improving the quality of the public sector management matters in terms of allocation resource, but the crux of the matter is in the accumulation of capabilities by the private sector. The investment, the decision to invest, the decision to learn, the decision to acquire technology uh, and, 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 and develop the ability to adapt it and, and, and eventually to become uh, an entrepreneur. In, it's incredible going back to Brazil, that the three cases that I mentioned as islands of excellence, of high income levels, the three, the sophisticated agriculture, Petrobras before Dilma, 
uh, and and in Hebrew, they are exceptions that confirm the rule. What do they have uh, different from all the other sectors in Brazil? They function like value chains. Embraer is allowed to import whatever parts and equipments they, 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 they want from the rest of the world. Petrobras, before being submitted to local content and to being obliged to buy, uh, to buy uh, wells from, from Brazilian producers, Petrobras could buy. So Petrobras focused on what it uh, did extremely well. One interesting thing, an anecdote, when President Moreno invited me to come to the, uh, to the IDB as one of his vice presidents, he asked me to prepare a, a short report on explaining why Petrobras was so well as it was at the time. And, uh, and, and then one of the items that I, that I highlighted was the ability of Petrobras to operate like as, as the core of, of a value chain. Uh, specializing in the service that it could do well. And also the regime in Brazil that submitted Petrobras to the obligation of uh, being contestable in the domestic markets. Uh, Petrobras did not have the monopoly of, uh, of uh, producing in Brazil. I understand that uh, at the time, uh, that's when Colombia changed its regime. And guess what? Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, not long after, when, when there was the, the scandal uh, uh, about Petrobras in Brazil, uh, Ecopetrol was quite ahead in value vis-a-vis -vis Petrobras uh, per share. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the, the operation, the challenge is that things are evolving. The wave of technological revolution, uh, technological change uh, taking place, they will call back to uh, advanced economies some of those chains in the value chain, uh, where the the, the 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 cheap labor uh, gave an advantage to to countries to other countries. Uh, the the combination of three D printing. Uh, with uh, the the uh, the smart manufacturing and so on, may make harder uh, to replicate the experiences of the Asians. Uh, but 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 we can do. I guess Colombia is on the right path in that regard. But uh, 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 what we need to do is. To, to, to open trade and to do the domestic structural reforms that allow the benefits from, 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 from trade to be accrued, to be transformed into local capabilities. That's, I would say, the overriding uh, wave of reforms that, that our countries in the region need. Okay, thank there, you. There, there might be a, a, a deviation about it also depends on how trade will evolve. Will evolve. We are watching uh, with the, the pandemic a partial reversal of globalization, which was a trend that was already there, uh, and and we might have some sort of a, of a reversal. I'm not talking about only the, the the technology war between China and the U.S., but also the reconfiguration of value chains uh, in search for higher diversity. Uh, as you all know, the, the, the new IDB president uh, elected, was elected, carrying this flagship of transferring value chains from Asia to the region. Well, and, uh, and there might be opportunities for doing so in some segments. I know, I know, many people in Colombia who are thinking of this. Thank you, Taviano. Uh, Luis Fernando Mejia, please. Thank you, Taviano, for that very nice presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, what do you think is the impact of um, the social security model that we have in Latin America? Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of discussion about the, the impact that uh, 
informality rates have on productivity growth. You think that this is just an issue that if you do uh, the rest of the reforms uh, is going to be solved or Contrary to that, do you think that uh, unless uh, the region makes an important change in the way that uh, we feel that uh, social security social security contributions are are borne by by formal workers, uh, unless we change that, there's not going to be a, an important rise in, in labor productivity. Uh, I would like to your opinion on that. Right. And the other point is about something related to what Luis asked before is, but more particularly to a sequence of reforms. Uh, from your discussion uh, of the previous questions, you, you seem to think that uh, openness to trade comes first, and then uh, maybe you can do a parallel or maybe in a sequence form the rest of the reforms. Uh, I would like to take uh, to have your 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 take on that because uh, I mean even in this in this current juncture, thinking about opening up uh, economies in the region, it's is very difficult. Uh, and uh, do you think that that's going to be the the most important issue before uh, attacking the rest of the reforms, or you could do some uh, sequencing that uh, leads you at the end of the day with more open uh, economies, but also uh, with the increase of the local capabilities as you discussed in, in during this talk. Thank you very much. Right. Perfect. Uh, first, you touched on a very important sensitive point, which is the informality and the state of arts of uh, what we may call the social protection systems in, in the region, uh, in which you have this, uh, this uh, segregation of the insiders uh, and, and those who don't have the, the, the luck or the opportunity to be inside, to be left aside. So uh, we have to make formalization uh, less of a burden and 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 uh, and so to have in, we also have we have to make the difference not so large, and we have to have social protection systems that are really uh, not unfriendly to the labor occupation. I uh, I, I strongly believe me and, and my ex colleagues at World Bank, for instance, of the high effectiveness cost ratio of uh, conditional cash transfers geared at the most vulnerable part of the population. It works, it's not uh, that much costly. The whole uh, conditional cash transfer program of Brazil, and it's the same thing in Mexico, uh, uh, until recently, uh, cost 0 0.5 percentage point of Brazil GDP with a strong effect in terms of lifting people out of miser misery, and also with a potential long-term gain, uh, given that the conditionality is exactly having the mother uh, uh, take, uh, taking the, the, the babies to, to, to healthcare, and also school attendance. So the, 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 the bang for the buck, in the case of, uh, uh, focused conditional cash transfers is is humongous, rather than the the uh, the when I look uh, the case of Brazil, uh, the, the the pensions uh, things have changed, and the results will come only gradually after the pension reform of, of two years ago. Uh, but but it but it's absurd. It was absurd. Brazil has uh, had, had uh, at the time prior to that, a bill with pensions uh, as a percentage of GDP that was equal to Japan and Scandinavian countries. Guess what? But the share of the Brazilian population over 65 years old is, was, and still is probably, half of Japan and Scandinavian countries. So you have a, a younger uh, population, uh, 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 a younger population, that's right, but with pensions were equivalent to the ones of, 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 and that was because of the generosity of the pensions. So if you include uh, the pensions into the, the, the social protection system, and, and that applies to other, other benefits, other programs, you have a, a, such a, a, a uh, a system that favors up 
not below. Uh, the the the, uh, the 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 Brazilian uh, set of uh, tax exemptions plus fiscal transfers, including pensions and so on, uh, is a uh, Robin Hood upside down. It takes from the poor to give to the rich. So uh, we will need uh, a reinfor uh, a re uh, an enhancement of social protection uh, uh, systems. In Brazil, the, the, the Bolsa Familia, the condition of cash transfer will not go back to the same size of before. The pandemic, uh, the pandemic showed it clearly that the universe of people in need is much bigger than, than the original set. Uh, and, uh, but the fact of the matter is that we need to focus on what works, on what uh, embeds, like in the case of the conditional transfer. You do have to pro provide, provide opportunities of education in, 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 and retraining. The Brazilian education system, uh, like in, in our region as a whole, it needs a revamp uh, so as to, to, to have a profile of uh, skill creation that it's closer to what the productive system needs. I think this is something as well quite important. On the sequence of reforms, yeah, definitely you saw my bias in favor of uh, uh, trade opening. Uh, it's gonna be painful for some, yes, uh, but the gains outweigh the costs and, uh, and, and it all hinges on, on the governments, on the countries uh, helping the losers, uh, helping including when it comes to migration to regions because some regions will be losers, some others will be winners. Uh, uh, but, and, and you have to provide, uh, you have to reinforce the, 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 uh, the social protection system without tying the support to specific jobs. We have to move towards uh, something like, these kind of events like to call the flex security. You have a, 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 a buffer of, uh, of, uh, of uh, benefits of, of income uh, to protect you, but without associating with specific jobs. Uh, but and then trade openness might be a priority, particularly for case of the countries uh, still close to trade. Infrastructure as well. And then we have a challenge because the problems of productivity dovetail as well with the, the, the lack of fiscal space. And uh, uh, so the, the set of structural reforms uh, allowing the participation of the private sector in infrastructure also matters substantially in the sense that uh, Colombia has been using well the private sector participation in infrastructure. It's that um, at, at, at a more advanced stage than the case of Brazil, according to my colleagues of the World Bank. Uh, but you need to have, because of the lack of fiscal space for public investment. So uh, whatever possible, uh, it, it's important to, to create the conditions for the private sector. Uh, of course, some segments will demand the public sector when the externalities are, or when the, the, the uh, the appropriation of benefits is, is harder to obtain than the, uh, given the externalities and spillovers, you have to have a public entity. But in many areas, in many segments of infrastructure, the private sector can occupy, can finance, can manage even better than the private sector. And, and, and this may, uh, so we need infrastructure. And, and the doing business environment in general, in general, which includes the 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 the, the, the trade chapter, the trading across the border, uh, and and that's that's the one uh, uh, difficult. Uh, I have a, a personal experience in that regard. I remember when uh, I was in the government. I was the deputy minister for international affairs. And the boss, the minister, calls us, the deputies, for a meeting. And he starts talking about the possible priorities of uh, structural reforms to be, to be pursued. 
and reforming the bankruptcy law was immediately uh, spotted by, by us as the easiest to make progress on. And we said, well, the bankruptcy law prevailing in Brazil at the time, that was 2003, had been enacted by President Getúlio Vargas back in the 30s. It's obviously so, so laggard, so uh, inadequate, so inappropriate, so out of date with the needs that, you know, we will be able to implement, to, to pursue this before without opposition and so on. Nobody will write articles in newspapers against it. And then the minister instructed the one of us, uh, Max Lisboa, to go and talk to a congressman who had presented a bill uh, some time before. And the guy was enthusiastic and there we went. And then we prepared the bill uh, for the uh, reforming the bankruptcy law. You know what? The moment the bill landed in Congress, it received 120 proposals of amendments. What? And the final bill approved was had only half of what we put there. The bankruptcy law only had its reform completed last year, or yes, last year or to 2019. That is to say 16, 17 years later to our amazement. But well, well, how come nobody writes articles uh, in the newspapers calling us of, uh, of uh, whatever, now liberals and so on? Well, <laughs> the network of judges and lawyers who made money by exactly having such a difficult process as the one uh, coming out of the bankruptcy law uh, had their representatives in Congress as well uh, uh, avoid the reform. So those structural reforms uh, they they conflict with vested interests, and and maybe that's why exactly they are hard to to obtain in our region. But I would definitely, if I had to sequence, uh, I I, I would go for the trade opening uh, together with the the at least the ones that that allow the uh, the appropriation of benefits from trade. Okay, thank you, Otaviano. Now, uh, Rudy Holmes. Rudy, go ahead, please. Thank you for the presentation, Otaviano. I have more or less the same question that Luis Fernando uh, uh, made, but I have a variant that um, I would like to ask. Suppose that we that we manage to change the financing of the social security system and the health system so that it becomes a finance directive of the taxes, not by salary taxes, but by the by the by the central government taxes. And then we managed to reopen the economy because what we did in the in the in the 90s has been reversed by by the lobbies of the of the private sector. And we have an open economy and a social security system that would be that would be a, a giving a, the same treatment to to the formal sector and to the informal sector. I still think that the need for capabilities uh, would be lacking. I, I I don't know how we can we can we can we can uh, move to that point. In other words, you know, we we would be missing policies on that in that direction. That that is my my, my question. And and a curiosity. But when you mentioned the capabilities and organizational skills, uh, my first thought is is thinking back on on, on Hirschman. And you didn't mention him. Does it have any any lineage? Uh, uh, are you a, 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 some basis on, on his ideas on development? Because he, he mentioned at that time that the main the main uh, uh, constraint for, for development was precisely the the capability of, of, of people that they, they needed to take decisions in favor of development that were not skilled in that in that matter. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yes. Starting with this uh, last one, uh, I definitely so. Nurx was one of my readings for my thesis and for the work that I did afterwards. 
I must confess that I relied particularly on Richard Nelson and Sidney Winter and, uh, uh, and a literature on, on technology, uh, which is uh, nicknamed sometimes as evolutionary uh, economics. Armin Alkian. Armin Alkian was also an important intellectual reference for me, uh, which are exactly the, the case, uh, the literature that called attention to those intangible assets, to those components of, uh, of, uh, of learning and, and, and the selection processes, the market competitive uh, environments and so on, which can, are not fully captured by simply using uh, the concept of a fixed capital. Yes, you responded right. Uh, that has been an important reference. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and interestingly, I, 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 uh, I believe that the conversation between the, the two communities, economists and technology scholars, is less than what it should. You still have, uh, well, the, the literature on endogenous growth start doing it. Particularly the, the, what Philippe Aguillon did, uh, I like more the family, Philippe Aguillon's uh, family than, than, than Paul Romer's. Uh, but they, Paul Romer, when he was chief economist at the World Bank, we used to talk. And, uh, and once I provoked him, I asked Paul, I see strong connections between your endogenous growth model that gave him ultimately the Nobel Prize later, afterwards. I see a connection between that and, and the tacit idiosyncratic uh, uh, features of technological learning uh, mentioned by Richard Nelson, Sidney Winter. And he said before me that he, he knew the literature, he had written, he had read. Uh, I almost provoked him, you should have quoted them, you should have cited. <laughs> uh, because those guys uh, score uh, a point by, by calling attention to these uh, uh, aspects that go beyond simply accumulating machines or, or, or uh, simply increasing the number of years in school. You're right, that, that comes from my tradition. Uh, that's a tradition I come from. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Otaviano. Now I have uh, Francisco Lloreda. Francisco, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Octaviano. Uh, Francisco Lloreda from the oil and gas industry in Colombia. Brazil, like Colombia, uh, heavily relies in the oil and gas industry. And I would like you to comment on how do you envision the energy transition in Brazil? And in particular, uh, uh, do you think it will be affected and how by the current economic situation? Thank you, Octaviano. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 we all know that the, the future is not, uh, let's say, very bright for oil. Uh, but at the same time, it's a blessing to have oil, uh, given the opportunity that the proceeds from exploring oil are used to accumulate the other kinds of assets. Mm -hmm. Is what we, one makes of the oil, right? Which includes the public sector has an important uh, uh, part of it. Uh, it is not only the accumulation of technological cap capabilities by Ecopetrol itself, but uh, as it was the case in, the, in, in, in Petrobras until recently, it may, be, may return to it in the future, but uh, it's the taxation of the huge dividends that should be used exactly to boost the education base that should be used exactly to, to, to improve the infrastructure uh, overall in the country and, and so forth. Like Norway does, like Canada did with other natural resource. Uh, like 
Saudi Arabia is trying to do. <laughs> Saudi Arabia distributes to the Saudis and so on, uh, offers them uh, two hour a day jobs. One of the problems of the World Bank working there at the office once I visited is that, you know, the, the, the journey, the daily journey of the guys is very, it, it's a way to transfer money, uh, transfer income. But uh, what the, the prince, the crown prince is trying to do, uh, which is what the other, the, the, the GFC, the, the, the Gulf uh, oil producers are trying to do, is exactly to create other assets, to not to be eternally, forever dependent on oil. And the, and, and the same thing will have to happen uh, in our countries, uh, in, in Brazil and Colombia. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's making it a blessing. Whereas uh, this is, and, and this is not, uh, in all accountings, discovery of uh, the inclusion of natural wealth makes the country richer in principle. But whenever uh, the quality of governance and the use of the proceeds is uh, reflects a bad governance, then you have the, the curse. And you have so many examples of curse. Uh, for for uh, Angola, it has been a curse. For uh, uh, Guinea, Equatoria Guinea, Equatoria Guinea, uh, you know, not long ago was classified in the in the World Bank classification of countries as high income, and in per capita terms, they are they were high income, but at cash, yeah, it, it, it's a place where you know the whole wealth is uh, taken by uh, some. And uh, in the rest of the population uh, stays in misery and so on. There, it's a curse. So I guess uh, is the channeling of the proceeds to education, to infrastructure, and to reforms, and to improving the other sectors. Okay, thank you, Tavian. Thank Santiago. you very much. Okay, Santiago Montenegro, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, O o Otaviano, thank you for your presentation, which I find uh, uh, excellent, excellent, very stimulating. Thank you. Um, um, before before uh, uh, making a commentary and, and asking a question, uh, I, I maybe I, I will invite uh, uh, the president of of our private competitiveness council system, Rosario Cordova who is among us, you know, to react to your presentation. I think uh, she's the right person to comment all of what you've said, you know, but um, uh, I think she's still with us. I don't know. Um, well, and, and so my commentary, you know, um, is related to, to, to the core of, 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 of your arguments, you know, to, to, to our country's needs, uh, to to improve uh, what you call the the cap capabilities, the educational education is critical uh, to improve uh, our business environment in terms of litigation, uh, the judicial the judiciary is the easiness to work, uh, an infrastructure uh, that the links uh, our our firms to value chains and the like, you know. But when 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 you think if we have the capacity to develop those capabilities, when you think about the capacity of, of our, our government, our state to do those things, and even the capacity of, of the private sector to work together, you know, to do yeah. these things together, you get a bit depressed, you know. Oh. <laughs> because, <laughs> because that capacities are very low and even, uh, if we develop that, you know, it, it may take 25 years to develop an education system, you know, that, that, uh, that, that, that improve, in, in, improves things, right? So if, if, if that's, if I'm correct, and I hope I'm not, you know, <laughs> uh, you, you may think about other options, you know, you, you may think uh, about Switzerland, a country with the highest or, or one of the highest per capita 
income in the world, uh, which has had the capacity to bring people from abroad to do things within Switzerland. The proportion of non-born non Swiss among the, the total population of Switzerland is 30%. The same number for Canada is something like 22%. Even for the United States, it is 14% yes. non-born non uh, uh, people living in, 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 in these countries, you know, have the capacity to, to, to attract human capital, brains, you know, um, to, or to educate people, you know, Chinese, Afghans, Indians, and, 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 and um, offering them jobs within the United States, right? Now, right. if you ask me the number before the Venezuelan immigration, that number for Colombia was one third of 1%. Now with the Venezuelans who have come to Colombia, you know, around 2 million perhaps, that number will go up to 4%. 4% of the Colombian population uh, are uh, non-born Colombians, right? Right. Uh, but of course, these are not people with, you know, with the MBAs or PhDs, you know, they are very poor people, you know? Uh, uh, but, but, um, uh, but, but anyway, that proportion for Colombia and I'm sure for, for Brazil and other Latin American countries is quite low. So, you know, so that's my question. Is that an option? And maybe the second question is, what will be the effect of these Venezuelans, these immigration that has come to Colombia and to other Latin American countries? Thank you. Now, uh, definitely, I, I fully agree with you. Uh, that, uh, you know, taking refugees, in the case of, of uh, Venezuela is more of refugees than, than anything else, uh, is, is a challenge, is costly, uh, and is not uh, a source of hope, apart from some case of qualified people there who decided to, to move, that you can, whereas you said it all, uh, the U.S., Silicon Valley, uh, is highly dependent on skilled uh, labor migration or people who come to study here where I live in the U.S. Uh, my kids are examples of this, uh, who study and, and, and not by chance, uh, smartly, Biden will facilitate exactly the, uh, the transition, the case of, of, of the visas for those who have, uh, the, in the case of the, the, the STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Yeah, uh, the imports, the brain drain, uh, as one might say. We, we, we don't have this. We, I, uh, Brazil benefited a bit at certain moments uh, from the brain drain from Argentina, <laughs> but it was mainly uh, psychoanalysts, not, not engineers. <laughs> <laughs> With due respect, with due respect to, to, to uh, Freudians and so on, but uh, but uh, uh, we we all have to do with what we have. There is no no other alternative. Now, but and you said it quite well. Look, let's think of the the. There are some templates, some good templates. The case of the Brazilian agriculture. The success of the Brazilian agriculture, I'm talking about the, the part of the Brazilian agriculture that is able to compete with, uh, with the US. The, even despite the toll that is taken from, from the, that agriculture uh, by the lack of infrastructure. Okay, this Brazilian agriculture, which by the way, uh, can be exactly replicated uh, in in uh, in Colombia, in a certain part of Colombia, that uh, once you guys get rid entirely of the plague of, of the guerrillas, and and you can incorporate that that part of Colombia. Uh, I, I I say this because last time I was in Colombia, uh, 2017 no 2018, uh, I was we were received by uh, President Santos. And, and there were many questions about the possibilities of replicating the Brazilian model in that part of Colombia. 
uh, you have to have the minimum infrastructure, you have to have the security uh, 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 in order to have the investment so on. But uh, what was the Brazilian model in the case of, of the agriculture? The Embrapa, which is a public sector research institution, made a lot of research in adapting seeds. Uh, in the case of sugarcane, which I know a little bit better, uh, uh, at certain moment, Brazil had 500, Embrapa had reached 500 different types of seeds uh, for, for sugarcane. I visited uh, a, a, a small ranch, a small, relatively small uh, hectare, hectare of, 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 of land in Minas Gerais with the president of the World Bank at the time. That was 2006, yes, 2006. I accompanied the, the, the World Bank president and we visit that place and the owner and manager very proudly, an engineer, an engineer, uh, explained to us how in such a small land area, he used 18 different types of seeds. 18, I, wow. Yes, he had a seed appropriate for an area closer to the river and another one that he used in an area uh, farther from the river. He had one type of seed to use in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a cliff, uh, close to a cliff, another one in a more plain area. So the guy estimated. Which, yeah, to make to maximize the, 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 the crop, you know, according to the to so but see how this example translates what I'm saying. You had the, the 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 everywhere in the world we know that research in agriculture always has a public sector component, even here in the US. Uh, but you had but, but then what mattered was the capacity by the, the, the producer, the engineer, in combining and maximizing the yield by cherry picking the type of available seeds among the 500 so as to maximize his crop. And more, the guy used weather forecasting to know how to make the things. The guy, uh, uh, so it's science-based, it's technology-based, it's, it's service-based. Like the, the flowers in Chile, the flower in Chile is the same thing. Uh, so uh, you, you, you have to have a combination of public and private sector uh, efforts to accumulate capabilities and that applies overall. So you're right, we have to have a combination of those. And, uh, and, and, and uh, to extract the maximum that, that we can. Uh, the, 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 the stupid thing to do is how, for instance, Duma did, which was to incur in public debt to provide finance to the private sector, crowding out the private sector through the BNDS to finance bulk investments, rather than having a policy that would be more selective in, in financing in the risking or financing only some segments of the value chains that would make possible the private investments in the other ones. So in all, there is not a case of a success that I know that has not had some sort of a combination of public and the private efforts. That's true. In Embraer, Embraer uh, originally was a state company that was privatized. And, and when it was privatized, it started to operate like a value chain and, and it, it succeeded in getting what they got. Guess what, my friends, I got my, 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 <laughs> my, my internet back. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me see if I can. Uh, I, I will send you anyway, right away, uh, my, my slides, if they can be of any help, okay? Okay. Uh, definitely I will do that. Okay. Let me, see. Let me see if I manage to at least. Uh, 
Ah, the, 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 the host will let me mean, let, let me soon. <laughs> Oh, it's a pity that's only now. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, Otaviano, I see I see no more hands raised in the group. And I think it's uh, it's getting there. It's time to conclude, I think. And uh, just a, a salute to Astrid, who remains as young as when I met her first 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Astrid. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Kat. Uh, Astrid, you have to say something. <laughs> <laughs> she is et eternal. Estás <laughs> en mute. Astrid, estás en mute. You are on mute. You are on mute. Oye, Rosario no está. En Brasil, en, en Brasil los, los tres enclaves que mencionabas, Otaviano, sí. eh, hacen la diferencia con Colombia. O sea, también importa el punto de partida, con todos los errores del pasado que pueda haber. La, ese, la existencia de esos tres enclaves hace, hace una diferencia muy grande. En, en agricultura es un abismo. Eh, y lo común es eh, la baja inversión que hemos tenido siempre en, en investigación, en, en tecnología, en, 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 en investigación y desarrollo. Y eso parece ser insuperable en Colombia. O sea, todo candidato presidencial propone 1% del PIB de inversión en esa materia y, y estamos bastante lejos de eso. Esas capacidades toman no sé cuánto tiempo, soy bastante pesimista al respecto. No y sea. otro son los encadenamientos, porque eh, Petrobras generó el desarrollo de grandes firmas de ingeniería también a través de sus contratos, capacidad en el offshore compitiendo con Shell eh, a nivel mundial. O sea, Brasil siempre, siempre mira, mmm, más, no sé, eso de un mayor de un mundo, es, es, eso hace también la diferencia. Nosotros tenemos una visión cortoplacista, eh, proyectos pequeños, por eso hay que hacerle adición a todos los proyectos de infraestructura. Entonces, yo siempre que volvía de Brasil en vacaciones me deprimía. Uh, eh, pues, como pesimista. Yeah. At the same time, Astrid, in other respects, uh, uh, think. Uh, the, the decline of uh, per capita GDP since 2015 uh, has reflect, reflected the, the macroeconomic mismanagement over the, the, the previous year. Uh, Brazil combines what I call a double disease, which is a combination. And uh, by the way, the host, could you authorize me to, 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 to share screen, I, if I may? Go ahead. Uh, um, Marta, please share a screen to, to him. Uh, at least I will give you an overview of the slides. Uh, I'm dying to show them. But uh, co uh, continuing, Astrid, uh, the macro management uh, it, it reflects a prolonged combination of uh, productivity anemia in Brazil with the public sector obesity. It's incredible how the public spending uh, rose at the rate of 6% in, in real terms, that is say above inflation uh, on average from 92 to 2014, mm -hmm. then it stabilized. But it's incredible. It, it did not become a problem because the taxation on consumption, on, the, on, on, on wage earners uh, allowed the revenues to rise until there was the exhaustion of the army of, uh, of people to be integrated. Uh, but at the first moment that that ended, the country entered into a fiscal crisis that is still, still living through. Uh, and, and, and this macroeconomic mismanagement is to a large extent the responsible for this recent decline of GDP. 
So the country could be in a better, better position were not for the, 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 the terrible, uh, the, the terrible mismanagement. Aha, look at this. Let me show you what I had. I, I will be very brief, no worries. I will not repeat, no worries. But, but just to give you, uh, well, the first chart that I wanted to show you is this one on GDP per capita. Look at Korea uh, and look at Brazil. And here, how Colombia coming from behind has already uh, crossed. And this is 2020. I have here until 2020, okay? Uh, but the difference here is humongous, isn't it? When I wrote my thesis, it was here. Astrid was there yet, right, Astrid? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me, uh, this is what I called the absolute approach to the middle income trap. Look at how uh, Argentina, uh, Brazil, this is, I took from a, a work by the ADB, and this is an accident that Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay are here classified as high income countries, but uh, Argentina since then has come down and uh, and, uh, but look at Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, we became middle income long time ago and we rest there. Whereas Singapore, Thailand, Thailand is, is uh, uh, well, but, but Korea is the best case. It goes from low to high income in a generation. Look at this, hey, impressive, isn't it? My thesis. And this is the relative approach, look at how uh, the per capita income, GDP per capita vis-a-vis -vis the US uh, went up in the case of Asia, went up in the case of Europe, and we have stagnated, particularly in the last few years. That's why we have the social uh, <laughs> discontent in, uh, even in Chile, in mm -hmm. other places. Uh, okay, I described the middle income. This is the composition of wealth that I was referring to, okay? Uh, look, uh, th those are average. And of course, this component here of, uh, of uh, natural capital uh, varies. There will be the rich, natural resource rich countries uh, uh, with this at a high level and the poor uh, natural resource uh, wise countries like Korea down. But in all of them, the weight of natural capital declines that I was talking about is the Colombian oil uh, serving to accumulate <laughs> right? Uh, and you have fixed the capital, uh, you know, uh, stable, is not produced capital that explains. And yet it's human capital that tells you the story. Human capital here, uh, incorporating the intangible assets, the capabilities story. This is the IMF working paper that I mentioned. Uh, and, uh, well, look at this. I, I, I wonder if you guys would get interested in that. It's very merciful, this effort made by the World Bank. Das Gupta is doing something like this now for the UK government. But uh, the, the World Bank has done it three times already, which is this attempt to measure the natural wealth and, and combine it. And look at this, total wealth per capita. Look at the difference. This is 2014. But look at produced capital, as I said, human capital, look, that's where the difference is even largest. Uh, in spite the, the lower natural capital in the case of, of, of Korea. So the story is here on the human capital and capabilities. Look, this chart shows uh, uh, in the case of uh, R&D, the gross domestic, domestic expenditure. Look at the beauty in the case of China and in the case of Korea. And in the case of patents as well. Uh, in electromechanics, uh, Korea is performing. And this is a, a, a let's say, the, the, the outcome, this is the, the manifestation of how well they used the, the, uh, the knowledge uh, acquired through globalization to develop their own capabilities. This is the capabilities escalator that I, that I, that I mentioned. Uh, our precautions, the industrialization, but again, it's not the sector. Well, the problem is that the, because if you, this reflects to a large extent our inability to, to rise productivity in, in, in industry uh, to the point of uh, making it possible to extend a bit the, the industrialization. The industrialization is a strong trend in advanced economies, even in China now, 
in, in whatever, because as income rises, the, uh, the, the demand goes relatively to service and also uh, the, the, the costs, uh, uh, the tradables uh, increase. And, and so you have a tendency to deindustrialize. In, in the region, it has been precautious, but this does not explain our lag, uh, our, our uh, this is, look, look at this. This is the productivity that I mentioned. We lag behind the US in all of them, in all three things, agriculture, industrial service. But it is interesting, in, in Brazil, agriculture, this is an average. So you have the fantastic modern agriculture, but you have uh, a wide uh, uh, range of agriculture that is poor. Argentina goes well, that's what saves Argentina, right? Has saved so far. Uh, the exercise that I mentioned and my propaganda of my book, <laughs> released in, in, in January, and this is my website where I post my things and, and texts and so on. If, if any of you is interested, please go there and, 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 and subscribe. It's a pity that I couldn't use it uh, while I was. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Otaviano. I, I, on behalf of this group, I have to thank you very much for your, your presentation, your answers, your patience, and your, <laughs> in general, your very easy and nice interaction with this group. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank My you. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I wish I visit you guys as soon as this damn 